All right, welcome all. This session will be all about how to leverage multi-sensory learning in your classroom. Feel free to get a pencil or something, a pencil and a paper to capture notes. Um, you could also just use your brain if you have a good memory and you could also use your phone to take notes, just whatever, because I'm gonna be asking some reflection questions as we go, um, just to sort out your thinking. All right, before we start, just a little about me. This is my 10th year teaching in Montgomery County. I'm currently at Snowden Farm Elementary School and I've taught grades two to five. I'm currently in second grade. Um, I'm a mom of two kids. I have a six-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. Um, my husband is also a teacher. He teaches at Halley Wells Middle School. He's the eighth grade history teacher. Um, and basically my whole motivation for this session uh, was just my life experiences. This year at my school, we're piloting a mainstream social emotional special education program, which means that the goal um, is to have students mainstream for the whole day from day one. Um, another motivation or kind of rationale for being interested in this is that I've taught uh, just the general special education children for many years throughout my career. And lastly, um, just my experience with tantrums and emotional dysregulation with my own children. Disclaimer, I am no, in no way, shape or form a professional on this topic. I simply heard um, a podcast and I applied some strategies in my own class. And I thought, man, I really got to share this with some of my colleagues. Um, some things that might seem obvious to other colleagues for me, because I'm kind of just like a loud, rambunctious person, was not as like common sense to me. So these tips really helped me. All right, just letting in final people from the waiting room. All right, so the first thing I want you to think about is what comes to mind when you hear multi-sensory learning? Some clues on the right side for you. Maybe you could think of a lesson where you've invited students to use their senses. I don't know, just what comes to mind. And you can either raise your hand or you can just write it in the chat. Mm hmm hands-on, manipulatives, differentiated, good. Oh yeah, me too, Sean. I originally think of just like the five senses um, in this podcast I listened to. That's what I learned about the other ones, like the interoception in our organs and um, the vestibular and pro. I don't even know how to say that word. <laughs> I would need to listen to the podcast again. But yeah, me as well. Um, different ways students can learn, visual support, accommodating each student's needs at, as the best way to receive information for each kid. Good. Wow, we're such great teachers, everyone. All right. Look at us. Okay, just to begin, I thought this was a very basic um, introduction to multisensory learning. I think anyone who's ever been around an infant, a baby, or a toddler, you see that the very first way that many of us learn is with our senses. Our brains light up significantly more when we're able to touch and interact with our learning rather than just looking at something. Um, so I'm, I can give you a minute to just skim over this page to set the ground for learning. Okay, so generally speaking, when we are able to learn with more than one sense during a learning experience, learning is usually boosted. Sensory integration is what really sets the foundation for learning. So all sensory systems must work together. So all those systems we saw on page one, well, too far, this one, must work together to facilitate our regulation, attention, sitting upright, writing, reading, organizing materials and engaging socially. And notice that list starts with like the most basic skills, just like regulating your body's functioning, 
sitting upright and then it kind of gets more, um, I guess, complicated as it goes down, more of those executive functioning skills. So we receive information through our senses. We hear things, we feel things, we smell, we touch. We're then, our brains and our bodies then work to organize that information and then we use it to interact with our environment. All right, for most of us, we learned a lot of this at our, in our teacher prep programs. We learn about UDL, we provide visuals and hands-on opportunities for our students, and we use whole body teaching methods. I'm making a lot of big assumptions here, but I just know, I can just sense that we're all doing those things. So the next step in our learning is how to monitor sensory modulation when multi-sensory learning actually becomes overwhelming for different learning styles. So I noticed in the chat, different people wrote, oh, it's very hands-on, um, but at the same time, we do need to differentiate that for our students. So I want you to think of a time, and you can write it down, or again, just imagine it and then share it in the chat. Have you ever planned an interactive lesson that you thought was going to be amazing because you had all the hands-on things, you had all these different centers, but then things lost control? Maybe you had a kid sitting in a corner while other kids just immediately became hyperactive. Think about that moment, maybe during reading centers. For me, it's usually during science. Science falls at the end of the day. Yeah, someone else agrees with that science. Zyra. Okay. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. So in preschools with kids on the spectrum, for sure. Good. So I want you to keep those students in mind as we go through this. The ones that their fight or flight kind of fight, flight or freeze kicks in and they're doing one of those three things. Because again, while the multi-sensory approach does appeal to most students, we have those other students who um, it's hard to modulate their senses. Okay, so I want you to actually put yourself into one of these scenarios. And again, you can write it on your paper, think about it, put it in the chat, or you could even raise your hand and we could actually have a conversation together if you would like to speak. Um, so on the left, we have the one where you're trying to plan at the end of the day with your team, trying to get things done. Announcements for dismissal are blaring. Kids are in the halls during dismissal. It's so loud. You already have a headache. And then those beautiful fluorescent lights that we have are making it even worse. How will you react to any task demands in that moment? On the right side, maybe if you're just perfect during planning and that never happens to you, here's another scenario. You're trying to talk with a friend you haven't seen in a long time. You're preparing dinner. Your kids are coming up asking for things. Their little Netflix show is on in the background. And again, people are bombarding you with task demands. How do you react in that moment? And again, you can either raise your hand or just write it in the chat, whatever you are comfortable with. Hmm, <laughs> yes. Distracted, stressed, reactive. That's a good one. Snapping. Mm-hmm. Good. Wanting to scream. Freezing or shutting down. Yes. Yelling. Overwhelmed. Oh, I forgot to talk about on my About Me page. You probably noticed, wondered what the, I don't know if you noticed, but there were these little loop earring headphones in there. And it's because I bought those to wear in my own house <laughs> to drown out the noise. They kind of work. But yeah, I had to buy those to regulate my own senses. Good. Trying to tune it out. Just annoyed. All right. Good. I'm not alone here. We are all human and that is natural. So sensory modulation is our brain's ability to either dial up or dial down how much sensory input is received to prevent too little or too much stimulation. So our body really, our body functioning is supposed to help us with this. It's supposed to be able to drown things out, um, sometimes if you're bored in a meeting and you can't dial up the stimulation, you might get up and need to like stretch the legs and get some blood flowing. Um, so yeah, that's sensory modulation. Yeah, Sean, your wife also got them. Yeah, see, we're all in this good fight together, my friends, as teachers, parents, caretakers of young ones. Okay, 
So sensory modulation is linked with our feeling of safety. Even if we're within our own home where we know we're safe or with, we are within our own school where we know we are safe, when we are perceiving particular sensory inputs, it again triggers that flight, fight or freeze response via activation of the amygdala. Don't ask me where that is in the brain. I just know it's a part of the brain. Um, so in the planning scenario, like you guys said, we might become defensive. Like, why did this, they make another science change again? Being irritable or maybe just zoning out, being the teammate that's like, guys, I'm here, but I'm not here. Or if just feeling unproductive in general. In the parenting scenario, it might look like you're starting, you're like, you are about to tell your friend a story, you freeze, and then you completely forget what you were even saying, and you don't even bother going back to the conversation, or like many of you said, sadly snapping or yelling at the kids. So now I want you to pause and shift those feelings. Do you ever recognize any of these behaviors in your own classroom, in your students? All of those things I see in one day, maybe even an hour. Thanks, Donna. Yeah, all right. It was kind of rhetorical. I know everyone sees it every day. All right, so this is where sensory modulation comes in, okay? It varies from student to student and from situation to situation. Our ability, again, to dial down or dial up um, our senses, Mm -hmm. um, will impact how they behave in school on a particular day or in a particular class. So what we may think when a student is looking like this is, oh man, why does that student keep doing that? I, I've already told them and they're acting badly. When in reality, the child is dysregulated, just like we as adults can become dysregulated from not being able to modulate sensory information appropriately, right? And as teachers, because we're fixers, and we're kind of like hometown heroes because we're raising up the next generation. We always wanna fix everything. So we're like asking them over and over again, hey buddy, what's wrong? How can I help you? Let's go, let's go. Do you need a drink? Do you wanna take a walk? Can I help you? And the reality is that can add to a child's feelings of being overwhelmed and it can heighten actually a dysregulated state. Um, factors that impact sensory modulation, sleep, diet, life changes like moving, environmental stressors, like a new baby in the house, or maybe parents divorcing or just being in separate homes. And then finally, neurology. I know, Heather, um, you've been putting in the chat uh, just your students that you've had this year, right? It could be none of those things, but neurologically, there's just a different wiring in the brain that is causing them to become overwhelmed. Um, and something this woman mentioned in the podcast is even again for adults, isn't life so much louder and brighter and overwhelming after a long night, I'll just say that, or when you haven't had a full night of rest, when you haven't had en enough to eat, think about that old Snickers ad, if you're hungry, why wait, remember like the grumpy actors, right? So if us as adults, we're feeling that, our students are definitely feeling that um, tenfold on a daily basis. Ultimately, right, they're just kids, even if they're in fifth grade, they're just big kids. Or if there's middle and high school teachers in here, those are just really big kids. All right, so there's a lot on this screen, but this quote really stood out to me in the podcast. I think a lot of times, I'm just gonna let you guys read it, actually. I hear you, Colby Kent. All right. So a lot of times I think when I think of a student who is dysregulated, I'm imagining the kid who is literally bouncing off the walls, like running and things like that. But um, the often overlooked group are the students who don't really act out, but they just want to lie down. That is how they're responding to being um, understimulated, actually. They might need that physical touch or a verbal cue to really dial it up. 
Um, so I just want to throw in this slide because not having enough sensory input to the brain can impact learning just as much as having too much. All right. So a lot of you might be saying, yes, I see this every day. I go through this. So what to do? And it's actually once I heard and learned about this, it actually made a lot of sense to me. So can I just see a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs to the side? Have you guys ever heard of co-regulation? Because I had not. Oh, nice. Mary Garner. Rush. OK, some of us have. I think like us, the special ed people maybe <laughs> have learned this already. But co-regulation is the attuned and responsive interactions between a child and adult that allow them to reach a state of regulation together. Because let's face the facts, when the kid is dysregulated and you're working hard to work with them, it also elevates our heart rate, right? It's hard, really hard to stay calm for that child. I haven't shared the slides yet, but I definitely can after. I'm happy to do that. Um, so co-regulation is the process of one nervous system literally responding to the state of another nervous system. It's unconscious. It's automatic. It's a survival necessity. It goes both ways. And it's how children learn to self-regulate. So this is not something that kids just know how to do. Just like math is explicitly taught, reading is explicitly taught, self-regulation needs to be explicitly taught. Okay. So this might look like a kid crying. They lost in a game, a fun game in the class. They're crying and they run out to the hallway. This looks like pausing first as a teacher. Instead of saying, what's wrong? What happened? Okay, can I do this? Pausing, taking a breath, offering a calm present, giving nonverbal cues, a verbal reflection of feelings. Like, wow, I can see right now you are in the, you're in the red zone. You are mad. How can we get you back in that green zone? I'm going to sit here with you while we just think about that. It's relaxed, getting down on a student's level. Oftentimes, I will just plop right next to a kid, maybe even lower than them, just to show them I'm not going anywhere. Smiling and speaking quietly. Again, some of you might be blessed with those like nice, calm, quiet voices. My voice is pretty booming normally, so I have to like, like remind myself how loud I'm being. Um, a big thing that again stuck out to me is you have to co-regulate before carrying on with any task demands or asking questions to the student. Because again, when the student's amygdala is in that fight, flight, or free zone, they really need to calm down before they can even access that higher level thinking of problem solving or completing a, a task in the classroom. Um, I like this image because we don't, we're not like really in the classroom always like hugging the kids, maybe like we would with our own family children, but you can just come stay close with them, stay calm, help them once they're a little bit more calmed down, name the feeling behind the behavior. And I know in a lot of classrooms we have, um, in my school, we do zones of regulation and it looks like this. It's like zones, what zone are you in with feelings? Some schools just have a feeling chart. If you have that somewhere outside of your classroom or in a nice little cool down corner, have them point to which one they're feeling just to name the feeling and then offer them help when they're ready. The one thing I tried this year, um, just given my new group of students, is I have kids who will resist me completely. They're like, just no, just go away. So I'll calmly just tell them, whenever you're ready, I am here for you. Come give me a tap when you feel ready and let them know I'm walking away, but it's not because I'm not here for you. I'm here for you, but I noticed that you need some space. So I'm gonna walk away and tap me when you're ready. And I didn't think it would work, but it actually did work with one of my students who was always pushing me away. He needed it to feel like it was his choice to come to me rather, um, you know, kind of take an autonomy over his own emotions. Just trying to find my notes. All right, so I am going to throw out just a few different scenarios. Um, I have two different ones, and I want you to reflect on them and how could you use co-regulation? Because obviously you're not going to do like every single one of these things every time. Someone in the last session said, I have a kid who hates breathing. Like th when I tell them to breathe, they, they don't want to do that with me. So I want you to just imagine that student, okay? And okay, here's scenario number one. A, you did a go noodle because the kids were sitting for a long time, they got a lot of work done, 
And at the end, a kid just keeps bouncing and they're like, no, I don't want to get back in my seat. And you're telling them, I need you to get back. And they're like, then, then things start to elevate and they're saying things like, it's not fair. I didn't even get to do the go noodle I wanted. How would you use co-regulation with that student? And you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. And you're the experts on your own students. So you can imagine who might that student be in your class and what would you do with that student? I love, I'm an art teacher at elementary school and I love uh, snagging kids in the hallway and like close the door mostly so the other kids don't see them or hear them and just checking in on them. It's not so much that I'm trying to give them direction or whatnot, but just to check in and see how they're doing or whatnot and give them an opportunity to kind of share <clears throat> what's going on. And then if needed, then I'll hey, say, hey, you know, you weren't being respectful, responsible or, or safe or whatever, but uh, just giving them the time to kind of talk um, in a private space where they're not necessarily around their peers. Because the why is always important more so than sometimes um, correcting them sometimes. Mm, mm -hmm. And I love that, you know, that's protecting their dignity, you know, so they're not embarrassed or ashamed. Mm, yeah, approach them once they've had a chance to calm down. Good. Provide them with the safe space in the room. I've noticed a lot of teachers lately, I know I have one this year, um, have started kind of like little cool down corners with those prompts, with the feelings charts. Good. All right, scenario number two. It's exit ticket time during math or whatever subject that you teach art or they have to show their learning somehow. And the student starts growling and you can notice that they're frustrated. And as you approach them, they see you coming and they start crying. How could you co-regulate with that student? In an ideal world where you're not also frustrated <laughs> from the long day. Sensory tools, nice. I guess along with the sensory tools, um, something else like a job around the class, or I mean, one they've calmed down, but something where you're moving them from their state of mind, kind of distracting them for a bit. Um, yeah, just trying to change their state of mind a little bit. Yeah, that's a good one. It's like forcing them to kind of shake out of that and use their executive functioning, and then it like totally turns the brain around. Yeah, just say, you know what, let's not worry about the exit ticket right now. I see that you're like not okay. And this you're more important than this exit ticket. I love that. But then again, making them do it later <laughs> once they are in a better state of mind. Um, speaking quietly, good, getting on their level. Quiet proximity. Yeah, good, good, yeah. Again, look at us, look at us. We are fine educators. All right, well done. Okay, so at the end of this woman's podcast that I'm really giving you guys the cliff notes for, she alludes to this book called Don't Cry Duck. I tried finding it on Amazon and I couldn't find it, but it sounded so cute. So I think on the opening of the book, you have this duck that is wailing and all these different animals come, like the friend here with the happy face stick, trying to solve the problem um, and nothing is working. So finally, this little girl, you can see on the right, sets up a blanket and she says nothing, just silent. And the duck gradually comes closer and closer to the girl page by page because the duck senses the calm presence and doesn't need anything else but that and wants to be near that. And I thought, wow, what a powerful message that again, as teachers, we always want to solve the problem, but sometimes we just need to offer our calm presence. Rush Dan said, this reminds me of the book, The Rabbit Listen. I'm gonna write that down because again, I couldn't find that one, but maybe you can find that one. Thank you. Okay. 
course, it's a pen with no ink because that's life. Rabbit listened. Thanks. Okay. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share with you guys before we close is just, I was doing some additional research because I had um, a friend tell me about horse therapy and I thought that really related to this. Also, people who were here when I asked the twilight question, you guys remember this character here who his super vampire power was regulating people's emotions? Or I'm just outing myself as a super nerd. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, pretend I didn't put his face there. That's embarrassing. All right, so um, I'm gonna link you guys to some of these articles. Where did my notes go? Let me just exit out of this for a second so that I can find the notes. There we go. All right. The first article that I'm sending is, and I know we have so much free time on our hands. So just what you guys want, more articles. But I promise they're very short and digestible. Like you can just skim it. Um, this one is about how many studies show that calmness is actually contagious. And the second article is about the use of horse therapy. And in a minute, I'll share why I thought that was interesting. All right, so now that those links are out, I'm gonna put it back in presenter view. Okay, so the first one, the thing that stuck out to me on the bottom, it says, if another person is anxious or angry, for example, your heart might begin to race in preparation for fight or flight, or if a person makes eye contact that your brain perceives as warm and inviting, you might feel calm and connected. In this way, the physical effects of other people's emotions are literally contagious. And I'm sure you can all think of someone on either end, maybe someone who you're around them, you feel a little on the edge or reversely, someone who around them, you just always feel that calm. And then the other article is about how animals in mental health treatment um, has proven to be effective. Animals can aid in healing emotional and behavior conditions. Animals like horses actually can sense your emotions and they'll mirror them back, offering people a way to talk about their emotions without feeling overwhelmed or judged, right? Humans, it's kind of in our nature to, in the back of your mind, even if you're trying not to make some kind of judgment where a horse or an animal won't do that. So I found those to be um, fascinating. Miriam. And is it equine therapy? Because I was trying to say it in the last session and then I gave up equine or equine. I'm trying to think of the really great reading phonics. Equine. Equine therapy. Oh, cool. So your degree is in equine management. So cool. Yeah. So when I learned about that, I was like, wow. So in my classroom, I just need to like be like a horse, you know, non-judgmental, calm, um, mirroring what we want to see. All right, so that is it. Um, if you're interested in hearing the podcast that I just really pulled from, you can scan this and that will bring you there. Um, I also have the link if you just would like to see the notes here. I love the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. I do know of a place, Jenny Lee, I'm gonna stay on with you because um, yeah, I think there's, a, actually, I don't know if it's Montgomery County. I think there might be a place in Boyd. That's Montgomery County. Um, but yeah, I just basically looked up like, um, animal equine therapy. And then I think one came up in Boyd's. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay. And then I'm going to also link in the survey. I would love if you guys could fill it out or the people running this camp would love if you could fill this out. And then finally, I'll also link in the slide deck. Um, and I'm going to now stop sharing and stop recording. Thank you guys for being here.